everyone. Welcome to cook dinner with me. Sorry for the weird angle. In a few minutes it'll go away. The weird, this like light thing. It's because I'm glowing. Glow up. Oh, too bright. Too bright. Today we are making meatloaf and mashed potatoes for cook dinner with me. I'm very excited. This is a weird recipe and some of you are going to go, what? But this is my family recipe. And so there's actually a recipe to follow on this one. I don't have it. I don't know. I never use it. So it's just by my brain. But that's what we're making for dinner tonight. Meatloaf and mashed potatoes. I have been creating at uh, 425. Sounds about right. And in this bad boy, this is two pounds of 8515 ground beef. And it is the basis for the meatloaf. Hey Shirley, welcome. Uh, so this recipe, it's weird. It's weird. Um, but I love it. It's good. John's still on the fence about it, but you know, if you hear the pitter patter of little paws, I don't know if you can see him anywhere, but that's Walter and coming soon. There's Bella. We are, uh, puppy sitting this week. Is there an angle that doesn't have a big bright light in my face? No? All right. Sounds good. Uh, so here's make meatloaf with me. This is a weird, um, Esau family recipe. This is from my mom's mom. So we're going to start again, two pounds, 85, 15 ground beef. My mom uses a leaner one. I like a little bit fattier just because I'm weird. And then this is Campbell's vegetarian vegetable. You don't want the beef based one, but the vegetable. And yes, it's alphabets because it's delightful. All right, that's how we roll. And I'm gonna pop a can of that. And, oh. Most cooking shows probably don't have you like making gross sounds with a can. But this isn't an ordinary cooking show. So two cans of that. I have a feeling that this recipe probably originated with like, I don't know, Campbell's soup back in like, you know, the early 50s or something. It was probably one of those like sponsored things. But when you think about it, it really does have all the elements. Get out of there. There we go. All the elements of a great meatloaf. You've got vegetables, you've got tomato, you've got um, a breadcrumb of some kind, herbs and spices, egg to bind it all together. So it's pretty, not too shabby. I'm gonna take coarse kosher salt, and be generous with it. A um, little bit of pepper. And again, I'm going to go back to the white pepper because it's fun. Why not? So white pepper. And again, I don't measure. So yeah, that's that. And then here's the other weird thing because my family is also Syrian. We, um, we put cinnamon in our meat. So this is Saigon cinnamon from World Market. It's just what I have. And I'll put a ton because it can get overpowering even in meat. It's kind of weird, but that's how we do. So that's what this looks like right there. There's the, you can see the vegetable soup. You can see the herbs, not herbs. There's no herbs in this. See the spices. You can see all that. Hey mama, I'm making our meatloaf. And then I put a little bit of ketchup in it. Oh, that was gross. Okay. Ketchup. Ketchup. Cinnamon and meat is great. Yes, Jenna, it totally is. It's totally like, um, it's I think an underappreciated condiment. The first time I like really remember tasting meat and cinnamon together was at a Moroccan restaurant in um, uh, Newport Beach called Marrakesh. I think we took my friend Jen there for her 21st birthday and we um, had some kind of meal that was ground beef, eggs, cinnamon, and sugar, and like onion and stuff cooked together in a puff pastry, like a phyllo dough. And oh my goodness, it was amazing. It was so good. Um, so to this, we're gonna add two eggs. And I know that fancy people will be like, don't put your eggs directly in, but I'm not fancy and I'm okay with that. So these are two jumbo grade A chicken eggs. I almost said cow eggs because I'm not smart sometimes. Hold on, we're gonna wash because, you know, it's not, I'm, well, we're going to rinse because, uh, 
let's be real, my hands are going to be in this in a second. So then here's the other thing. So there is the other magic ingredient is a sleeve, at least, of saltine crackers. I'm telling you, this had to come out of some like Nabisco thing, like juggernaut. So what I do with these is I take something heavy. This looks good. This is my sharpening steel for my knives, and I'm just gonna take out all of my aggressions on this. Although you gotta be careful, because the bag does puncture, <laughs> and you have little, little bits everywhere. And you want it to be pretty fine, all right? So I'm gonna crunch it. The other thing that I'm gonna do is as I pull it out of the bag, I'm just gonna crunch it in my hand because that's how I work. So into, I want pretty fine, almost bread crummy, but if they're a little bit bigger, it's not the end of the world. Thanks. Bread crummy, bread crummy. We have no idea, oh snap. I cook kind of messy, so I may or may not have just gotten a bunch of bread crunchy things all over my counter, but we won't talk about that. Um, you know, it's so funny. I love finding out, like, what's the origin of something. Like, we all know that, like, Waldorf salad was kind of a thing. It became a thing pretty big back in, I'm thinking it's the 70s with Trisha Nixon's wedding and um, all that kind of stuff. It was, like, really popular. And um, post-war meals, like when America finally had, you know, rations had gone away and post-World War II, the food is kind of very interesting to me, like what America ate after that. Really fascinating. So, um, yeah. So these are really big chunks right now, but as I mix it, it's just, I'm going to crunch it up even further. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. This is what it looks like Whoop. right now. I have another half sleeve of crackers that I have over here if I need them, but I'm just going to go to town mixing with my hands. This is the part of making meatloaf that my mom finds really gross, like super disgusting because she has to put her hands in raw meat. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. And I just smoosh it until it's, you know, as though it's life dependent on it. And then the thing that you want to watch out for on this one is how juicy is the meat. You want to find a nice balance because you've added a lot of liquid with the soup and the ketchup and um, the egg actually, even though it's a binding and it's protein, it's still liquidy. So you don't want a goopy meatloaf, but you also don't want it to be too dry because then there's nothing. Um, the reason I use 8515 ground beef, and you could probably, if you were like an American, use ground turkey. Um, I've never tried it, but you know, if you do, I'll pray for you. Um, um, because you're adding in all these breadcrumbs, you really can get away with the higher fat content because it's not going to be too fatty because those breadcrumbs are going to absorb all that. And that's just yummy stuff anyways. So this is what I've got with the one thing. And you can see it's kind of goopy, which is gross. This would make a really fun like Halloween thing. But we're not there yet. It's not Halloween yet. So I'm actually going to add a little bit more. I have this other half sleeve of crackers and I'm just going to put them straight in and I'll crush them with my hands because this hand is gross and I don't want to wash it. See, if I were a legit cooking show, that would all be utterly unnecessary exposition. But this is real life, dude. Real life. Is this the real life? Is it just fantasy? Don't send me copyright. It's just a fair use version of the song you see. Oh, that was a good one. Guys, so good. Okay. All right. We're doing better. We have big chunks of the breadcrumbs in there, though, so I'm going to kind of break them up just a little bit because they're a little too big. But they'll be soft and pliable. It's a very fun texture, this meatloaf, when it comes out. It's like... I've had meatloaf with oats. Um, my old roommate used to make it with oatmeal. Um, and then John's family actually doesn't have like a straight family meatloaf recipe that they use. His mom's been on the hunt for like the perfect meatloaf forever. Um, and so every time I've gone over to their house and had meatloaf, 
it's been something different. Like they try a different version every time. Not so in the Mayhem house. These are probably things that should have been covered in premarital counseling, but you know, we didn't know. Okay. So my hand is disgusting. Ah, ah. Um, but this is what the meat looks like now with that little extra bit of stuff added. You can just see it's really well mixed and it's got a little bit of big chunks in there, which, you know, that's just how I make it. My mom usually um, breaks them up more finely, um, but she's not cooking it. I am. Sorry about this light. It's just my kitchen window is weird. So, okay. So I'm going to clean off my hand and then I'm going to clean off my hands. One moment. Welcome back. Okay. Now that my hands are no longer super disgusting. Ooh, I did forget one thing. One moment pantry. I feel like I should Mr. Rogers this. Okay. Um, I have some non-stick cooking spray. I like coconut oil. I started using coconut oil for the spray just because I think it's better. Then I have two loaf pans. We're just going to generously spritz. Okay. Uno. And dos. And then I know I just washed my hands, but actually, no, I'm not going to. All right, big spoon, divide it in half. <clears throat> so I just kind of make the meat even in the, in the bowl, the loaf, the pre-loaf. You know, I would do anything for meatloaf, but I won't get my hands dirty again. Won't do that. Um, okay, so then I'm going to. Make it even, divide it in half, like it or so. Yeah, yeah. And then, I'm just gonna start scooping it into the pans, into my prepared pan. And, um, and then I try to form the semblance of a loaf shape out of it because it's a loaf right? Um, not meat pile. It's not meat Sistine Chapel. Although that would be interesting. An all meat Sistine Chapel. Somehow I don't think that that's what they had in mind for that. Okay. So we're going to push it and smoosh it. There's a lot of, I feel like meatloaf is a great meal for if you've had a rough day and you just need to get some aggression out. You're just going to be beating up some crackers. You're going to be smooshing and pounding out some meat. It's just all in all a very cathartic meal. Now you'll notice that there's no garlic. There's no other seasonings in this because this is white America from the post-war era. I just flung raw meat across my kitchen. Good job, Jess. Okay, get in there. Okay. So here's one loaf, loaved, right? It's a little flat. So what I usually like to do is I go around the edges of it with my big spoon, or if I'm being brave and doing this with my fingers, I'll do it with that. And then I kind of create channels on the outside, and that's for fat runoff, just because whatever fat we do get, I want to kind of float up to the top and sit there so that I can get it off at the end. I don't really want to deal with it. And then that is that. I don't know if you can really see the, like the divot. See how the center is kind of higher than the outsides created this little like channel. So we're going to repeat over here. Although in hindsight, I think this one has more, I have put more in this loaf. It is a bigger loaf. It's a uh, 1990s meatloaf versus like 1970s meatloaf. It's bigger. Okay. 
And then we're just gonna, again, make the little channel around the outside because we fancy, okay? You can probably see this a little bit better on this one, right? Because it's a little bit bigger. Yeah, it's good? Okay, and then, because again, American, more ketchup, we're just gonna squeeze some on top. The nice thing about doing the ketchup glaze is that the sugars in the ketchup get nice and caramelized. And you get a lovely, lovely little crust on the top of ye old. What is this meatloaf? How many meatloaf references have I made today? And yet I couldn't think of what I was making just now. Um, what I what I should apologize for is the fact that I didn't go out and look up more meatloaf songs um, prior to starting this. But I do have a piece of meatloaf trivia uh, that I think you'll appreciate. Celine Dion song. Um, uh, when you touch me like this and when you hold me like... It's all coming back to me now. See? It's all coming back to me that the name of the song is It's All Coming Back to Me Now was actually written originally for Meatloaf and he thought it was not a good song for him and so he chose not to sing it and Celine Dion sang it and we just, we thank her for that. Thanks Celine Dion. Thank you. All right, Meatloaf, oven is on at, what is it on? It's on at 425. So I'm gonna take both my loaves my two loaves and no fishes because John doesn't eat seafood. And yeah, my oven says we're at about 400. It's not a very reliable oven and that's fine. Um, Alexa, set a timer for 45 minutes. 25 minutes, starting now. So that's that. Um, that is all of my wonderful meatloaf. Moving on to the mashed potatoes going to reset my countertop here. You know, if I were Rachel Ray, I would sound a little bit more like this. A. But B, I would take a commercial break and then someone would change over my set and then life would be good again. But I'm not Rachel Ray, so this is what it is. All right. Cutting board. Down. Uh, where is my big Big tall stock pot, fill it with water. Am I the only weird one who likes to play a game with my stock pot where I like try to fill it up, like balance it on the center? I have like a two sided sink and I just feel it's really important to balance it. If I am, I acknowledge that, that I am super weird. Okay. Potato peeler. Potato. Potato, potato. All right. And since I am doing no skins potatoes, I'm not going to bother washing them because that's annoying. Ain't nobody got time for that. But these are some big old russet potatoes. Um, okay, that's too much water. I fill up my pot about three quarters full and then go from there. Um, so we're just going to peel some potatoes. What are some fun facts about potatoes? Potatoes are starchy. They're God's favorite carbohydrate. He told me. It's a direct revelation from the Lord. Um, to be fair, I think that probably the best uh, use of potatoes, I mean, there are many amazing uses for potatoes, and we should be very thankful for the state of Idaho. For many reasons, it's a lovely place, I've been told, but also potatoes, and I love potatoes. You can fry them, you can boil them, you can bake them. Um, but, because I am Italian, as we previously have learned, I love, love me some gnocchi. Potato gnocchi is like, so good. So, so good. Um, oh, it's like the perfect comfort food because it is both Pasta and a potato. It's like double your starch, double your carbs, double your pleasure, double your fun. That's the statement of the great mint and double mint gum. Imagine if you weren't here to see this, I would be doing all the same things. But I'd probably be listening to a podcast. 
Um, so here's a fun fact. Um, I'm sure this is common knowledge, but it was not common knowledge to me. And so in case it's not common knowledge to someone else, I'm going to tell you my secret. It's not a secret. It's like I said, common knowledge. Here's my potato peeler. See this little guy right there at the edge, this little divity thing? This is an OXO Good Grips. And this is meant for if you have eyes in your potatoes, you just like core them out. Boom, Bob your uncle. Done and done. So a few little eyes here and there. And then I'm going to clear this board. I have a, in my sink, I have the meatloaf um, bowl. And like Rachel Ray, I'm using it as my garbage bowl. So I'll just dump everything at the end and then wash the pan and all as well. Um, here is my thing. Okay, so this is the first time I've ever cut on this show and I'm not, I don't have fantastic knife skills, but the one thing that I am like adamant about with knife skills, if you hold your knife like this, I'll have to leave the room because it's annoying to me. Don't hold your knife like this. It's bad. It's not, you don't have a good grip on it. You can't do as much stuff and it's a good way to lose control of your knife and cut a finger off. And safety first, y'all, safety first. So what we want to do is you want to grip the back of the knife like this. You want to have a good solid, like put your thumb down and then all the rest of your fingers grip behind that, all right? So you have a nice sturdy. And then you're doing um, uh, clawed fingers, which I suck at doing. I'm really bad at that. And then you're just going to rock the knife back and forth. There is a web series, if you look on YouTube, there's a ton of web series on how to have good knife skills. Every once in a while I watch them and pretend that I'm a chef. Um, but this is how you should do it. I swear if you do this, I will come for you. Not really. Okay, so I can't, and again, kind of can't really see because technology is not great. Because my stand is not, no, that's not gonna work. So we're just gonna pretend that you can see me chopping this potato because hit the camera's not that, whoa, danger, danger. Okay, so I'm just doing cubes, like cut sections. And I'm using, this is a um, Santoku, I believe. Yeah, this is the Santoku chef's knife. We were so outrageously blessed by the generosity of our family and friends when we got married. We had a lot of returns um, at um, Bed Bath & Beyond. And so John and I said, well, what's the one thing that we didn't want to register for because it was too much money. Um, but now that we've got some gift cards, because that's what you get when you return stuff at Bed Bath & Behind, as I refer to it, you get gift cards. And so we elected to get ourselves a fancy knife set. So these are Shun Premier, I think, Shun Premiers. And the set that we got didn't come with the Santoku, but I, I got one anyways because I like the way it cuts. So we're going for fat dice, yeah? And then I just put it directly in the water. Like I said, halfway up on the water. And, um, yeah, I'm just gonna dump. This is really thrilling. This is why they have stuff prepared on cooking shows. You don't see live cooking shows um, because it's boring. Uh, normally, you know, I would do all of these at once. You'd mise en place. Mise en place means stuff and things in place. Um, actually, that's my sister-in-law. She speaks French. She's fancy. She's a fancy girl and very smart and beautiful and I love her dearly. But she does legit speak French. She spent time over there. She did her master's work at the American University of Paris. So she's like, legit. Some might even say that she's too legit to quit. Okay. All right, so we're just peeling potatoes. I remember one year, we, uh, many years ago, one of the magical dinners we did at Valley, I um, remember doing our prep day because we did all of our fruit in-house. We had an amazing team of people. My amazing friend, Lori Wiley, like went through this whole thing and put all the food together and kind of ran the kitchen because she's amazing uh, culinary uh, mastermind. Um, but we did just, you know, mashed potatoes, just really simple turkey dinner, mashed potatoes, all that kind of stuff. But I swear, I feel like I peeled and diced so many potatoes because we didn't do a mashed potato. Yeah, we didn't do mashed potatoes. We did uh, roasted potatoes with uh, lemon and thyme. 
because it's easy to do for 200 people as opposed to trying to mash potatoes for 200 people. So because this is going to make leftovers, I bought three potatoes and we're using three potatoes to cut because John and I, John takes lunch to work every day and then I have lunch. I work from home, so I just have lunch for myself the next day. And, you know, it's an extra pound of meat and everything else is pretty cheap if you just double up, you know, double that, which is the standard recipe makes two loaves anyways, because then you have leftovers for the next day. It's fantastic. We save money because we don't have to buy lunch. Um, last night, since it was Bible study night and piano lesson night for me, John, you know, we had dinner separately and so there were no leftovers, so we each had to go out and get lunch today. But usually we try to do lunch at home. It's a good way to save money. And then, you know, we're eating, generally speaking, we're eating better. At least we know what we're eating, right? We're eating canned foods, but canned vegetarian vegetable and uh, meat, beef, meated beef. Okay, third potato, last potato, but they go quick, so it's no big deal. Um, what other potato facts do I have for you? Um, I'm sure somewhere you can find a potato that's been made into a French fry that looks like Jesus. That's usually a pretty common thing. What I think is less common are potatoes that look like any of the disciples. Um, and to be fair, I'm not sure how they know they look like Jesus. They probably look like the picture of white Jesus that's always on a wall somewhere. Jesus wasn't white. He, I know. I hope I didn't rock anybody's world just then. Jesus was, in fact, Jewish. Um, so he did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. And I apologize if that's a big deal for you. But truth bomb. I hope that was not entirely, um, I really hope no one thought Jesus was blonde haired and blue eyed. Doesn't matter if you've seen that picture. Now, to be fair, I had that picture growing up. Uh, my grandma had it on her wall, that picture of Jesus that everybody and their mom has seen, which is like blue eyed Jesus with like some sandy blonde hair who is like, like that Jesus. I've had, I've seen that picture a billion times, but pretty sure it's not what Jesus looked like. Um, how do we get there? Oh, potatoes shaped like things. Um, I once read a news article about a quesadilla that someone had made that someone thought looked like the Virgin Mary. And again, we just have an artist rendering. We don't know what they look like. I don't understand how we can determine that quesadillas and potatoes look like biblical characters. Although, to be fair, I once saw... I once saw a tiny pickle that looked like Zacchaeus. It was a one of those little gherkins. It was a wee little pickle. No? All right. Well, can't blame a girl for trying. I don't have good jokes. Good gravy. Okay. So all of our potatoes are potatoes. See how quick that was? Just a little fun chat. Sounds good. Um, and then this bad boy. And you want to give it a lot of salt because you want to salt the water primarily. Ooh, I'm almost out of salt. Somebody gets to stop at the store tomorrow because tomorrow we're making jambalaya mm, in the Instant Pot. And that's like one of my favorite meals. Um, actually, it's one of John's favorite meals too. So I have my pot of oh, potatoes um, and I'm just going to boil these bad boys up. I always bring them to a boil in the water, and then once they're at a boil, I let them go until they start to float and they're fork tender, um, and then I let them go a half second longer. Uh, and then um, make sure that you reserve a little bit of the liquid that's in there, not too much, you don't need a ton, but just a little bit to kind of help the mash, and it's nice and starchy. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with watching water boil because it's literally like the most boring thing. Well, well, but don't they say a watched pot never boils? So I want this to boil because we got dinner. So you can't watch. You're going to sabotage my dinner. Um, I'm not going to put any like um, uh, gravy. I'm not going to do a gravy with this one. But I probably will toss in at the end um, some cheese, maybe some sour cream, and kind of do a loaded baked potato or mashed potato. I literally just make the potatoes like mush them up the way I normally would. I like them a little bit chunky because I'm a little bit chunky and I feel like it fits, right? Uh, so ch a chunky mash is like a quick mash with a potato masher, which my potato masher 
looks like this and we just I'll do it right in the hot pan add a little bit of milk a little bit of butter and then at the end I'll throw in some sour cream salt pepper um, and some cheddar cheese and make some lovely uh, loaded mashed potatoes if I had any bacon I would put bacon in there but I don't currently have any in the house and I know that that is a moral failing for which I deeply apologize um, but at some point you know we are all sinners saved by grace for which I am very grateful Hey, while I've got you on the live stream video, something really amazing happened to me today. Um, I was at church and we were wrapping up our ladies Bible study, which if you are in the North Orange County, uh, what would that be? I don't know. Is that like Southeast? I don't know. La Mirada area. <laughs> um, you should totally come. There's also an online component to it. It's a fantastic study uh, going through the book of Ephesians and it's amazing. We just finished our first week. We're starting our second week. You can go to lamaradachurch.com, find the women's page and you can download the study. Even if you're not able to make Monday nights at 630 or Tuesday mornings at 930, um, just do the study online because it's really, really, really amazing. Uh, and special shout out to our women's pastor, Jen Richmond, who does an amazing job with that. Um, just solid, deep Bible study. If you're looking for actual Bible study and not like, you know, fluffy stuff, it's great. We had this girl call today while I was wrapping up from there. And normally I wouldn't be sitting at our desk in the office. Normally I would just be like, you know, doing my thing. But for whatever reason, I needed to look something up on the computer. And I sat down at the computer and then promptly forgot what it was that I was looking up on the computer. <laughs> And just then the phone rang and normally I wouldn't answer the phone, but I just like answered it. And it was this girl on the other end and she was absolutely hysterical, crying and upset and so worried. And um, uh, her name is Michaela. And I spent a few minutes, probably 20 minutes on the phone with her, praying, um, telling her about Jesus, telling her the gospel and how, um, yeah, her life is messed up, but God came for messed up people. God knows our sin and he loves us just the same. He came to pay the penalty for our sins. And, um, you know, Jesus paid it in full and our, 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 our file is marked paid. Um, and by, by accepting that and understanding that and then believing that he is who he says he is um, and entering into that relationship with him, that kind of reciprocal relationship, that she could have peace and she could have some freedom from um, the pain that she was in and the anxiety that she was in. Um, and so we prayed together, and um, I don't know the status of her walk with the Lord. Uh, she just was, she was, said she was embarrassed to talk to God because she knew that she was a bad person. And I said, but you know what? He doesn't, he doesn't care. He knows all your stuff, and he loves you just the same. So um, if you think about it, say a prayer for Michaela because she's hurting, um, and she uh, just, uh, I think, needs to know the peace of Jesus. Um, and then as we were praying, the bell rang and I realized that she was like a junior high, high schooler. She sounded young, but I realized that she's in school somewhere and lunch was over and it was time to go to class and wasn't able to get any of her contact information. Don't know where she was from, how she found us. Don't know how she got the phone number. Don't know anything. Um, but uh, God knows who she is and God is um, deeply invested in her. And so if you are, um, you know, you get a moment, I would just love if you would pray for her. Uh, to know that there are a bunch of people praying for her um, healing from anxiety. She has sounded like pretty bad. She was hysterical on the phone with me today. Um, and then by the end, as God God's peace overwhelmed our, our time on the phone, just it was it was incredible. So be praying for Michaela. Um, that's just kind of a weird aside. But since I had you all as a captive audience of live stream viewers, I thought it would be appropriate to ask you guys to pray for her. Um, that being said, meatloaf is in the oven at uh, 400 degrees, basically. I kind of play with the temperature and just kind of watch it. This oven is weird. I don't know how to use it yet. Um, it, it's just finicky, so I just kind of give it a little extra time and grace, uh, as we should give everyone extra time and grace. Uh, but I'll, I'll take a look and make sure that it's done. I, you can usually tell by the texture on the inside, and then I will stick a meat thermometer in just to make sure that it's at the right temperature, because, you know, salmonella. Not good eats. Uh, thanks, Elton Brown. Uh, then the mashed potatoes are diced up. They've got salt in the water, a good bit of salt, and then we're just gonna boil them up. And as soon as they float and are fork tender, then we'll strain them out, reserving a little bit of li liquid, mush them up, uh, a little bit of milk, a little bit of butter, some salt and pepper, and a little bit of sour cream and some cheese, and Bob's your uncle dinner's done. Uh, so yeah, this has been Make Dinner With Me. 
tomorrow, join me, same bat time, same bat channel. We are making instant pot jambalaya, and this is one of the easiest dishes that I make in the instant pot. They're all amazingly simple, but this one is really easy, really tasty. John loves it, and John knows like legit jambalaya, like what it tastes like, and so he, if he gives it his stamp of approval, I get 10 wife points, and I'm excited about that. So tomorrow, jambalaya, and then that'll be the last one of these for about a week, because we're heading out of Dodge. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for playing. This has been Cook Dinner with me, courtesy of Jess. I still haven't come up with a catchphrase, so tell me what your catchphrase is that you want me to do. Leave a description, leave like the catchphrase in the comments, like parry out or bon appetit. I think that, wasn't that Julia Childs? Anyway, whatever it is, let me know what your catchphrase for me should be. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Peace out, guys. Have a good night. Bye.